What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Tuesday, in the second week of Lent, we're continuing through the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 6 for some incredible miracles. We've got a word from a Lutheran church father, Martin Luther himself, about Abraham, actually. And then we've got our ongoing catechesis, instruction into the Christian faith. We're finishing up with the first article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Stick around. So I think it's important to stop. As we're going through the Gospel of Mark, and I always talk about this penitential time in the church here where we're focusing on our sin and our need for a Savior and that Jesus is going to suffer and die, and we reflect on the passion of our Lord. None of these readings thus far have really been about the passion of our Lord, but it's important to understand that the reason that Christ came was to suffer and die and to rise again. He tells his disciples this all the time throughout the Gospels. This is the reason that he came. So as we read through this Gospel of Mark and we see these miracles and teachings of Jesus, we see them through the lens of the unique Son of God who stepped down from heaven into human flesh to go to the cross. And what a miraculous God that we have that while he is going to the cross, he cannot help but have compassion on his people. So we pick up in Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five, and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups, by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on a mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, and moored, to the and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countrysides, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. So here we are, we're at the feeding of the 5,000, and this is explained for us in other Gospels, the definitive miracle. And Jesus definitely knew what he was going to do. It says as much in the other Gospels. But the problem had been given to Jesus. We need to, these people need to eat. Jesus, for a very distinct purpose, gave the problem back to the disciples. Will you feed them? The correct answer when we present a problem to the Lord and he presents it back to us is to do exactly what the disciples did give it back to Jesus <laughs> that's the right answer to give the problem 
to Jesus. And I think we learn a lot in the feeding of the 5,000. And, and if I could speak briefly, because our writing from Martin Luther is going to make reference to the Eucharist, to the Lord's Supper. Jesus is God, and Jesus is man. And he is both of these things at the same time. So Jesus can take five finite loaves of bread and two finite fish, and he can feed 5,000 men, not including women and children. And there are 12 baskets left over. What's also interesting is how Jesus always sends, doesn't he? He sent the disciples out to distribute this meal. So when Jesus takes unleavened bread, finite bread, and gives it infinite words, take this and eat it, this is my body, then we can take Jesus at his word because he is more than capable and when Jesus says, take this and drink it, this is my blood, we can have absolute confidence that this is true. Because I've heard the argument that Jesus is man and he only has this finite body. How can he give himself flesh and blood to millions of Christians every Sunday? Well, the same way that he can give five loaves of bread and two fish to over 5,000 people, they can eat until they are satisfied. And there are 12 baskets full left over. Now, what's fascinating about Jesus walking on the water is this, this statement, it is I. In the Greek, it's ego eimi, or more best translated, I am. If we ever have any doubt, if we're ever presented with someone who says, oh, Jesus is a great moral teacher, but he never claimed to be God, I am am jesus says jesus says i am all the time and this is the name that the lord god gave to moses at the burning bush and jesus is the great i am he is our emmanuel as the prophecy of old says god with us so this god with us wants to be with us and gives to us when his main focus is the forgiveness of sins through his suffering, death, and resurrection. He still reaches out to bless his people. So now we continue with a writing of Martin Luther. Now this is going to be about the promise made to Abraham, and that's going to sound weird, but in the treasury of daily prayer, there's an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading. I've simply been focusing on the New Testament readings for this Lenten devotion, but if you purchase the book or if you um, download the Pray Now app, uh, you will have access to all of it and to the Psalms and to a hymn for the day and to all sorts of little services of the word for different prayer hours throughout the day. But we focus on the writings of Martin Luther and the concept of a promise. Here it should also be noted that in this way God gives Abraham a palpable demonstration of his grace. He had promised him a son but he delays the fulfillment of the promise. Meanwhile, Abraham, who is satisfied with the word alone, believes the promise and simply clings to the invisible things. But it happens in due time that the invisible things become visible. We too should imitate this and set it before our eyes. We believe that our flesh will rise again on the last day. This should be as sure for us as if it had already happened. For we, too, have the word and the same spiritual comforts that Abraham had. Therefore, just as a hundred years ago we were nothing, so when death will have destroyed our flesh, our flesh will come forth from nothing and will live. Thus the things that have been at the present time instruct us clearly about the things we shall have in the future. Let no one say by way of objection that Abraham had the promise, for do we, too, not have the promises in baptism and in the Eucharist? In baptism, we have word alone, don't we? Word and water to look at. But we know that we have been buried with Christ into his death. We know, as Peter tells us, baptism now saves you. And in the Eucharist, as I mentioned earlier, it is the very body and blood of Christ given and shed for us and for the forgiveness of our sins. We have the promises of God and faith like Abraham, which is credited to him as righteousness, clings to the promise. Now, we continue with our catechesis. We conclude the beginning 
of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We could say much here about how few people believe this article, for we all pass over it, hear it, and say it, yet we do not see or consider what the words teach us. For if we believe this teaching with the heart, we would also act according to it. James 2.14 we would not strut about proudly, act defiantly, and boast as though we had life, riches, power, honor, and such of ourselves. James 4, 13 through 16. This first article of the creed ought to humble and terrify us all, if we believe it. For we sin daily, Hebrews 3, 12 through 13, with eyes, ears, hands, body and soul, money and possessions, and with everything that we have. This is especially true of those who fight against God's word, yet... Christians have this advantage. They acknowledge that they are duty-bound to serve God for all these things and to be obedient to him. We ought, therefore, daily to recite this article. We ought to impress it upon our mind and remember it by all that meets our eyes and by all good that falls to us. Wherever we escape from disaster or danger, we ought to remember that it is God who gives and does all these things. It is these in these escapes we sense and see his fatherly heart and his surpassing love towards us. Exodus 34, 6. In this way, the heart will be warmed and kindled to be thankful and to use all such good things to honor and praise God. This is how much is necessary at first for the most simple to learn about what we have that we receive from God and what we owe in return. This is a most excellent knowledge, but a far greater treasure. For here we see how the Father has given himself to us together with all creatures and has most richly provided for us in this life. We see that he has overwhelmed us with unspeakable eternal treasure by his Son and the Holy Spirit, as we shall hear in the articles of the Creed that follow. The biggest problem in the world today is a denial of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And if you're struggling, I think, as we go through the Apostles' Creed, if you're struggling to wonder how to proclaim the gospel to someone, it's as simple as saying the Apostles' Creed to them when they ask you, well, what do you believe? Well, that's a great question. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. So y you don't need to find your own words. The church has given these words to us, and God promises by the Holy Spirit that the right words will come. So when we look, when we've looked at the Ten Commandments in our catechesis, and we see in them our inability to keep them, and we look to the Apostles' Creed, we're going to see who God is and what he has done on account of our inability to keep them. We pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.